thank Jim Krauss, uh, who teaches aviation law at the school. And unfortunately, he cannot be here today. Uh, and I assure you, he, he wanted me to, I assured him that I would relate to you that he tried to move heaven and earth to uh, get out of this event because, or excuse <laughs> that was, boy, that was a bad slip, wasn't it? Uh, he assured me that uh, he tried to move heaven and earth to get out of uh, his other obligation to be here today because uh, this, uh, this event and bringing uh, our panelists to Duke Law uh, was certainly his idea, and I want to give him our great thanks. Uh, I also want to say a, a big thanks to uh, Brian Strand, who is here uh, just to the left, uh, who's been instrumental uh, in working with our panelists and on the logistics of the program, and also Jill Danforth from the Office of Student Affairs, who's been quite fantastic in, in her ability to promote this event, and I uh, thank you all for coming very much today. Uh, when Flight Pan Am 103 exploded over Scotland in 1988, uh, it started a process which no one could have imagined at the time. What followed was a unique uh, international litigation involving countries and continents, tortfeasors and terrorists, diplomats and daredevils uh, of the legal kind, I might add. The men in front of you were at the forefront of perhaps the most intriguing air disaster litigation ever uh, because it introduces as never before the terrorist side of aviation litigation and played a major role, if not the major role, in helping transform a terrorist state. Uh, the litigation has spanned 19 years, and it's still ongoing, and they're here to tell you about that litigation. I might start with, uh, start with Jim in the middle. Uh, Jim Crindler uh, and his father Lee from New York, from the, excuse me, from the New York firm of Crindler & Crindler, spearheaded the team. Uh, we were supposed to be, we were also supposed to have uh, Mitch Baumeister today, and ironically his flight was delayed from Atlanta, so, uh, so he can't be here. Um, also, Jerry Skinner, here just to my left, uh, now with the Nolan Law Group, was also a vital player in this litigation. Uh, and all these men are giants in the field of national and international aviation law, and they're some of the most respected folks in the field, as I think you will uh, come to appreciate as you hear them speak. Uh, Bob Maroney, on the far left there, uh, deserves special mention, uh, as he will tell you he was an unlikely player uh, in this infamous litigation, uh, but there he was at the center of it all, and uh, if you can imagine representing Gaddafi uh, and Libya at the time of the litigation, I think he's going to share some very interesting stories. Um, and this is a story that Jim Krause wanted me to, uh, to relay to you all. Oftentimes, he, was, he would ride the train home uh, in New York in the afternoons uh, with a friend that was an in-house lawyer at Pan Am Airlines. And a few weeks after this uh, event of, in 1988, he was on the train with that friend, and his friend was extremely agitated. And he was, his friend was hesitant to, hesitant to open up about uh, what was bothering him, but uh, finally, just to vent, uh, he turned to Jim Krause and said that he had just learned that the money that was collected from Pan Am passengers that was supposed to be used to ensure their security was instead diverted to help the ailing airline uh, because they were in some dire financial straits at the time. And he said, quote, when you guys find that out in discovery, he said, all hell is going to break loose. And it now appears that uh, his friend was greatly uh, understated. Uh, he greatly understated what was to come. Uh, Jim goes on to relate, little did I or anyone know at that time that this litigation would become revolutionary. And with that, I turn it over to our panelists. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and especially a pleasure uh, for me to be here with my, my friends, Jerry Skinner and Bob Maroney. Uh, Jerry and I have been doing the Pan Am 103 case now for almost 19 years, and, and, and Bob and I for the last 11 years, and it's been a very special uh, personal experience. Um, I, I, I love talking about this case uh, to law students because you're at a, a point in your life where uh, you're deciding what to do, what's a good career for you individually, and, and what is a worthy and noble thing to do with the legal skills you're, you're attaining. The Pan Am 103 case is unique in our nation's legal and political history. Um, our case against uh, Libya is uh, the first time, uh, to my knowledge, and probably the last time, that a quintessential governmental function was entrusted uh, to a group of plaintiffs' lawyers with some trepidation on the government's 
uh, part. Uh, it uh, ultimately uh, led to a settlement with Libya and the process of the United States normalizing relations with Libya, which is, as you all are acutely aware, the only diplomatic success of six years of Bush administrations. But uh, to, to understand the case against Libya, uh, you have to uh, start at the beginning and um, uh, learn a little bit about our case against Pan Am. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, uh, the Warsaw Convention, which is now ancient history. Does that ring a bell for anyone? Okay. Um, Warsaw Convention started in 1928, was a convention uh, ultimately adhered to by uh, nations in the world. And uh, the, the important aspect of the convention for our suit is in order to recover full damages from an airline in international travel, this is before 1999 with the advent of the Montreal Convention, but under the Warsaw Convention, the plaintiff's uh, lawyers had to prove that an airline was guilty of willful misconduct, intentional wrongdoing, to enable the plaintiffs to recover what their damages were in fact. Absent a proof of willful misconduct, you were limited to a recovery of $75,000 a death. Uh, when, um, on December 21, 1988, Pan Am Flight uh, 103 was uh, departing London Heathrow en route to JFK and on, on to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, that uh, aircraft was uh, known as the Maid of the Seas. At uh, 32,000 feet, uh, a bomb exploded uh, in, the, uh, in a baggage container. You've all seen those tin baggage containers at airports. And the bomb exploded in a container uh, known as AVE-4041, which was in position 14L in uh, the belly of the aircraft. Now, when um, uh, Pan Am 103 exploded uh, at that time, and most of you were, were, if, uh, were either not yet in, in grade school or, or, or just starting, but at, that was the time when uh, the threat of terrorist attacks against U.S. interests was extraordinarily high. Um, there had been a number of hijackings and bombings in Europe. Um, various uh, uh, Mideast groups were uh, uh, dedicated to uh, attacks on the U.S. And December 21, 1988, was only four months after the USS Vincennes shot down an Iranian Airbus uh, killing approximately 300 uh, Iranian civilians. Uh, Iran uh, vowed uh, revenge uh, for the Vincennes attack. So U.S. civil aviation was under threat, uh, and the threat level was extraordinarily high. At that time, Pan Am was the only U.S. carrier flying in and out of uh, Germany. Uh, it's before American and United and Delta were, were, were there, and Pan Am was seen as a symbol of U.S. aviation and, by extension, symbol of the United States. Um, when the explosion occurred, um, we, uh, of course, heard about it and started investigating it and discussing it, and we were hoping that we would be able to locate a mechanical uh, or design defect that was the cause of the disaster. Uh, with a mechanical defect or a design defect, we might be able to bring a claim against uh, Boeing, who, who built the 747 made of the seas. Uh, but five days later, on uh, the day after Christmas, the Scottish authorities announced that they had uh, found evidence demonstrating that there was uh, uh, a high-grade explosive in container AVE-4041 that was the cause of the disaster. This was the largest criminal investigation ever to take place. Uh, Scottish uh, police authorities were, were mobilized, British authorities were mobilized, 
and on their hands and knees, policemen crawled through the bogs of Scotland, finding debris from one coast of Scotland to the other. And of course, most of the disaster was over the small town of Lockerbie, Scotland. Um, the Scottish authorities uh, were soon able to determine that an improvised explosive device, an IED, was secreted in a Toshiba radio cassette player, that that radio cassette player with the IED was uh, inside a brown hard-sided Samsonite suitcase, and later the Scottish police identified 13 items of clothing from that suitcase, and all those items of clothing uh, were uh, sold in a store in Malta named Mary's House. And uh, many years later, the shopkeeper identified uh, one of the two Libyans who was prosecuted as the purchaser of that clothing. But right away, we realized that we were facing a terrorist attack directed against the United States. And our first thought was proving willful misconduct against Pan Am would be virtually impossible. No airline intends to cause the death of its crew and passengers. But uh, uh, being involved in aviation accident litigation, uh, my firm, Mitch Baumeister's firm, the Spicer firm, Jerry's firm, uh, had all decided we would get involved. And starting in January, uh, clients were calling us up. Uh, and, and retaining us. Now, um, at that time, and, and I know this will sound like uh, the dark ages to you, this was really before the advent of computers, and uh, there was no uh, uh, database for documents in the Pan Am uh, system, uh, but we served broad discovery requests on Pan Am and, and, and received boxes of documents in German and English and had to wade our way through them. Now, what, what uh, Jim, the story Jim Krause told was true. In the summer of 1988, the, the dying airline of Pan Am decided to cut costs. And uh, someone in the organization came up with the bright idea that given the heightened security threat, it would be good business for Pan Am to advertise an enhanced security program. Pan Am created a company called Alert Management Services to perform security for Pan Am. And starting that summer, Pan Am began charging an extra $10 a ticket for a security surcharge. And there were ads in the paper and on TV. You saw uh, policemen or seeming policemen in black SWAT team units parading German shepherds through Kennedy Airport. And this was the enhanced alert security that passengers were paying for. In reality, uh, these German shepherds were collected from various ASPCAs. Not only were they not trained in bomb detection, some of them were in house broken and the airport was a mess. So that ad campaign was, was, was scuttled rather quickly. But uh, Pan Am was in trouble and uh, Pan Am was, was cutting costs. And uh, the central uh, cause of the Lockerbie disaster was Pan Am choosing to disregard the FAA-mandated security rules for extraordinary security airports. Every airline operates under an ACSSP, an Air Carrier Standard Security Program. Airports are divided into domestic, uh, enhanced security, extraordinary security. And for extraordinary security airports, since uh, the world was facing bombs and unaccompanied suitcases, the rule was that Pan Am had to perform a match of uh, bags to checked passengers and could only carry an unaccompanied suitcase if that suitcase was physically inspected. Now, the match isn't too difficult for people who check in at that airport. The problem was interline bags. If you're flying on one airline to connect to Pan Am in a series of, of, of routes, that's where bags tend to get separated 
um, uh, from their owners. And, and at that time, before a computer match, uh, the only way to match up bags was to line them up at the tarmac. Some of you may remember the old days when before you could get on a plane on a rainy winter night, you'd have to go to the tarmac and point out your suitcases, and only those suitcases were loaded. Well, that was a time-consuming and expensive process for an airline. They didn't like doing it, and they didn't like the problem of offloading unaccompanied bags. So on their own, Pan Am decided to simply x-ray interline bags and carry them even if they were unaccompanied. Now, that was, that was the issue that enabled us to prove willful misconduct against the airline. Uh, we were uh, aided in that endeavor by the scandal existing in the uh, Pan Am security system in Frankfurt, uh, uh, one of the largest airports Pan Am flew to. Head of security was a convicted felon with a dishonorable discharge uh, from the United States military who would hire underage boys and girls, take them to uh, various notorious uh, brothels, uh, and after weekends with the boys and girls, they were promoted to supervisory positions in the alert management system. Uh, so so we- look like they're saying, we're never gonna fly again. Right. <laughs> thing, th things are not as bad now. But uh, that, that, that was the willful misconduct claim. Uh, the, the reason um, uh, the claim is unique and Jerry will remember this, but I think there was only four or five occasions when willful misconduct was ever proven against an airline. And our case is the most famous, the second most famous being uh, the Russian shootdown of uh, Korean Airlines Flight 007. Um, but to prove the case, we had to spend many years tracing how the bomb suitcase got to Pan Am 103. The uh, Frankfurt system was the most sophisticated baggage system in the world. Every suitcase that arrived at Frankfurt, either checked in by passengers there or interline bags, was put in a gray uh, plastic tray like you see at airports now, and each tray had a unique barcode. And someone would type in uh, where that suitcase was to go to. And if you're flying on American flight 12345, there was a code, and this tray would, through a binary system of going left or right at various checkpoints, eventually wind up at the departure gate. Uh, but uh, without uh, uh, computer records, this, this was hard to do. We were uh, extremely fortunate in our ability to, to prove how the bomb suitcase got on board Flight 103. Uh, um, the system in the Frankfurt Airport was called the KIK system, K-I-K, it's a German acronym. And every day, there was a record kept of the movements of all bags uh, to each outgoing flight. And by looking at the worksheets where a bag was entered into the system, you could see what arriving plane that bag was from. Uh, unfortunately, when we learned about the kick system, we also learned that uh, the records were only kept for 48 hours. And it appeared as if there was no record uh, kept. But you, you, you were uh, at the uh, Mrs. Erak deposition, I think in Frankfurt, we're taking the deposition of one of the Frankfurt people going over the system. And the process was, was very difficult. And many of the workers were Turkish. And, and in Germany, there's no direct questioning of witnesses. So we'd ask a question in English, what's your name? Interpreter would translate it into German. The judge in German would say, is your first question to the witness, what's your name? It would come back in English, we'd say yes. The question would then be asked in German, translated into Turkish, answered in Turkish, back to German, back to English for us, and then the judge would verify that that was the answer. So if Bob and I had hair when this started. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was 40 pounds lighter with a mustache and black curly hair. We aged fast. 
But we, we, we learned after three days of this process, uh, when Mrs. Eros was uh, discussing the system, she was on duty on December 21, and she said, you know, after hearing about the bombing, I became concerned. So uh, I went to the terminal and printed out the record uh, for that day's movements of bags. You did. What did you do with that record? Oh, I gave it to the BKA, the German police, who disavowed any knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. Said, we, you did. Did you do anything else when you gave that record to the German police who says no such record exists? Oh, yes. I made a copy. You made a copy? Did you keep it? I think so. <laughs> Where is that copy? Well, follow me. So we leave the courtroom, go through the airport to the lockers, go to her locker, she opens her locker, and there's her lunch, there's salamis, there's breads, there's change of clothes, there's drawings from her kids, there's extra shoes and sneakers, and from the bottom of this mess, she pulls out a crumpled sheet of paper. She had made a printout of the kick record of bombs, uh, bags lo loaded on December 21. And uh, we, we, we took about 160 depositions to prove that that was the root of the bomb bag. Now, that evidence ultimately formed uh, a key basis for the Scots prosecution of McGrahi and FEMA. And while the Pan Am case was going on, we were constantly giving the information we uncovered to the Justice Department to assist them in, in building the criminal case. And when the criminal case became sensitive, we would back off. So um, uh, we developed a very good relationship of helping uh, the US government and the Brits uh, in, in the criminal case. We tried the, case, the Pan Am 103 case for 13 weeks. Uh, jury was uh, deadlocked for five days. Ultimately, they came back with a verdict of willful misconduct uh, on day five. We then tried, uh, my dad tried the first damage case, I tried the second, my partner Steve Poonin tried the third, and we obtained the two highest uh, death verdicts ever returned uh, in a U.S. court or, or any court, Pan Am appealed. We won at the Second Circuit two to one. Pan Am lost its cert uh, petition. And ultimately, Pan Am's insurers settled uh, the family's cases for a total of $550 million in 1995 after seven years of work. So I want to stop right here and ask Jerry to chime in on the Pan Am case. Then, then we're going to uh, get, get to Libya. Well, I had a unique perspective. Um, Pan Am 103 was bound for New York, and that was an intermediate stopover. It was then going on to Detroit. Um, if I were to refer to this group of people, I'd refer to you as y'all. These guys say used guys. I'm the only attorney that was not from New York or Washington, D.C. that was involved in the committee work that was done in the case. And my entree to it, uh, way back in the beginning, in the end of 1988, just the first weekend, uh, the next year, 1989, uh, was to go to Detroit and to be interviewed by the family of the only Arab American on the plane, the only Arabic name on the flight manifest. And you can only guess the interest that that created in the media. Well, we met with the family and, and spent some time talking to Nazir, the father, who's a wonderful gentleman. If you could possibly be Arabic and be described as a mensch, which is a cultural impossibility, but he's a wonderful guy. But, and uh, he, he retained us. About 10 days after we signed that retainer agreement, my phone rings, and it's the local attorney that we hired to represent our interests in the Michigan State Courts with Nazir. And uh, all I hear on the other end is this anguished voice, he was the bomber! And it's been published in the Detroit newspaper that my client's son, who died in the accident, was indeed the person who carried the bomb on board the plane. You might, you might think that I would panic at that point, and you'd be right. <laughs> but as it turned out, and to get a little bit more into the, the, the perspective of what happened in the course of the litigation, as the individual cases developed, and as the committee developed the liability case, 
It was determined that indeed the young man had been in the Middle East where he had family. He had come back to the Frankfurt area where he had friends and family, some of whom perhaps had some questionable connections. So there was a kernel of truth in the midst of what essentially was a lie. Uh, we discovered later that one of the adjusters representing Pan Am's insurers had retained the services of a DEA agent, an ex-DEA agent, for $25,000 to fabricate a story that indeed the bomb was deliberately carried on the plane by my client's son. My client's son, when he was supposed to be uh, in the midst of being indoctrinated, was actually pumping gas at a West Side gas station in Detroit, Michigan, and was not involved in this at all. But that was sort of my introduction into the case, and after that, we were or at that point, we were retained by 11 other clients, and uh, it became the very interesting chase, which uh, Jim has described. As we got a little further into the case, and it became apparent that it was going to have ties in various Middle Eastern communities, one of the things I found, and, and one of the things you're going to find when you get out in practice, is you have to know the people you're dealing with well. And when you negotiate with somebody, it pays to know them very well. Their culture, where they come from, what impact that's going to have on positions they take. And uh, my, my position on this team, uh, which I was very privileged to be on, being the only one from a flyover state, you know, west of the Hudson, no civilization known to man out there, <laughs> all those kinds of things. My position was to know about the group of people we were going to negotiate with to have a greater understanding of Islam, what effect that would have on the people we were negotiating. Um, just to give you a, an example, as we got into the portions of the case that dealt with Libya, we discovered that talking to them seemed to be a never-ending process. You could spend two days negotiating a small point, and you think you came to a conclusion. You returned two weeks later to start up where you thought you had ended off, and instead you went back to the beginning and renegotiated the first point over again. That concept was known as Hudabiyah. It has to do with an accord that Muhammad uh, formed with a, with a tribal group that he eventually conquered. And what it means is when you're in a position of weakness, you agree to anything. And later on, as your position strengthens, you renegotiate. Knowing that that was the process that was going on helped us keep our heads on when we were doing all this. Um, my colleague at the left, and I'm going to ask him to contribute at this point, he was the other side. And that's why he doesn't have hair. <laughs> so Bob Maroney, what do you have to add? Uh, now I'll get to the interesting part of this story. <laughs> the actual Libyan litigation has nothing to do with an air disaster. That was a causative fact. But it's actually the first, and I think the only suit fully tried on the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Now, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act started out as a very simple, direct piece of litigation. Basically, you're involved in commercial activities. A foreign state loses its ability to avoid suits. Someone decided, well, let's change it to the Let's Get Libya Act, or otherwise known as the Lawyers Full Employment Act. And under that act, if you were found to be a state supporter of terrorism, you lost your immunity. Now, imagine this. You represent Libya, who has gotten the most wonderful press. You, the only reason you're in court is because the government has declared you a state sponsor of, of terrorism. And the statute of limitation that you're working with is 10 years, but you don't include any time during which you were immune from suit. So basically, you have almost an eternal statute of limitation. As a defendant, you're in a wonderful position. Everyone loves you. Your client is very sympathetic. And you have all sorts of defenses in the law which come down to zero. Now, let me go back one bit. Jim stated that the articles of clothing that were found were bought in this shop in Malta. I think he overlooked a minor point. While the clothing was purchased, or at least originated in this shop in Malta, the person who claims to have seen, dealt with the person who bought claimed that the person was Libyan because he knows what Libyan looks like. I don't know. I've seen all kinds of Libyans, and I didn't see any distinguishing mark. He also had identified someone else from photographs several times, 
and only found out it was Libyans after being taken on a, ship, uh, a fishing trip to the highlands of Scotland, a most reliable witness. Also, it wasn't uh, developed because it wasn't found out till later. The luggage or baggage on the Maid of the Sea was offloaded at Heathrow Airport and segregated. There was a break-in where the lock in which the segregated uh, baggage was kept, the lock of the room, was actually cut. And the, I mean, th this one staggers my mind. The excuse for this was, well, employees don't like to walk around this area to go someplace to smoke or have a, a sandwich, so they cut the locks. That really brought a lot of credibility to it. Be that as it may, one of the two Libyan gentlemen was found guilty. And by the way, that litigation is also, they have this uh, practice where you almost can uh, appeal after appeal in, uh, under the English system, and that appeal is now uh, going, going on. What had happened, uh, you all know that a settlement is not an admission of guilt. A settlement is a commercial opportunity. Where one side decides, I will give up this and accept the consequences, but I will gain this. For Libya, it was very easy. I will gain access to worldwide markets, I'll be able to sell my oil, and I will pay, yes, a staggering sum. I think 2.7 comes to Jim, billion dollars, which was a temptation. I was trying looking at countries that don't have extradition treaties, but I never got that, that close to the money. <laughs> Uh, it was a temptation, though. Right. What happened is, well, the negotiations took place in France and in England. They had English speakers, French speakers, Arabic speakers. And something would go around the table, everyone agreed in one of the languages, and then it would be put in another language, and you'd have people screaming, no, 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 we never agreed to this. So we would go through a translation process. Plus, everyone with whom we negotiated on the Arab side was named Mohammed. So if you would say, Mohammed, what did you say? You might have 10 or 11 people <laughs> standing up, and you say, oh, it's Mohammed over there. Could you please explain? Without this litigation, and it could have been the bitterest of litigation, could have gone on for years, and it still is going on, as a matter of fact, but a, a small point. Um, but what happened? Sanity took control, and we had an excellent judge. The judge who said, had people who knew what they were doing, and evidently had confidence in them, he let us chart our own course. As well, we kept reporting to him, and we kept showing up for status conference, but he could have turned this into a nightmare by insisting on absolute compliance with the federal rules of civil procedure. Do you know how many trees would have given their lives for meaningless interrogatories alone? Discovery of documents, unbelievable. Which leads me to another point, and then I will be quiet. Well, actually, two points, because uh, I'm always asked. One is, how did you get involved with Libya? Quite accidentally, I had met a Moroccan attorney who was practiced in France at an International Bar Association conference. The fellow's name is Abdel Hay Safroui. Abdel Hay Safroui represented the government of Libya. He needed an attorney for this case, and I was the only one he knew in the United States. So that's how I got involved. Plus, added the fact that no major firm, and I contacted many of them, would have anything to do with it. The client is guilty, we're not going to get involved, it's bad, we're going to lose other clients. Uh, wonderful for our reputation as attorneys and this vow that we took when we became attorneys, which comes back to, I will defend people without fear or favor. Or well, we should add to, sometimes. The government of Libya is strangely formed to our concept. They don't have departments, they have committees, and the committees rotate every year. So they have a litigation committee for the Lockerbie litigation. Now, literally, I know the number sounds astounding, but it's true. There was 1,000 members of the Libyan litigation committee. You ever try and get anything done on a committee, and you add 1,000 people? So you'd send off for a document. 
You'd never get the document. You would never hear from them. You would never know where it was. Now, the chairmanship of the committee rotated. Now, you had some who were expert in the Islamic law, Shira, which I'm probably terribly mis mispronouncing, who had no idea of the concept we were dealing with. We had others who were expert in Libyan law, which is a mixture of Arabic, French, and Italian law, who was also at sea. Every now and then, you remember for many years, the, the um, chairmanship of the committee would go to someone who had never an American law background, but an English law background. But at least we're talking about common ground. I also had to work through a law firm in which the senior partner of the firm did not speak English and had no intention of speaking English or having anything to do with the people and who, who spoke English. So not only did I have honorable opposition, I had problems with my own client just getting anything done, and I got nothing done. A law firm that I think was dedicated to sabotaging the settlement, we came to an agreement all of a sudden and I remember Jer I was sitting opposite Jerry, almost walked out of the room. Someone came up with the idea, and I remember who, uh, let's make this an ex gratia settlement, a gift. You know how far that went? No place. That'll give you the background of probably the most fascinating litigation I have ever handled in my career, and I, since I'm on the downside of my career, which I probably will ever, ever handle. But thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Well, let me um, uh, chime in on, on uh, a very uh, unique aspect of, of how we got to do what we were doing. After uh, we settled uh, with, with Pan Am, as Bob said, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act was amended through the lobbying efforts largely of the Pan Am 103 families. And the 1996 Effective Death Penalty and Anti-Terrorism Act provided that suit could be brought against the seven state sponsors of terrorism designated under the Export Administration Act. That time it was Libya, Iran, Iraq, Cuba, uh, North Korea, uh, Sudan, and Syria. And we started our suit. There had been other suits started against Iran and Iraq, but both Iran and Iraq had always defaulted. Libya was the first of the seven nations designated as state sponsors to appear in a lawsuit. Libya did appear and challenged the constitutionality of the 1996 Act, and ultimately uh, the, the Second Circuit affirmed. By the time that was done, we're at 1988, and uh, probably one of the most important events to take place in the litigation and it's something uh, that'll never really happen again, certainly with uh, an administration like this, is we were invited to uh, the vice president's office uh, for a joint meeting of State Department personnel, uh, Justice Department personnel, and the lawyers for the, the plaintiff's committee, the, us. At that time, the UN Security Council resolutions uh, Ha, uh, imposed sanctions on Libya, trade, embargo, military sanctions. And Libya had to do the following to comply with those sanctions. It had to turn over Megrahi and FEMA for trial, renounce terrorism, accept responsibility for Pan Am 103, and pay compensation to the victims' families. Now, before our involvement, whenever there was a dispute between nations, Compensation was handled by the State Department and the Justice Department. So when the Vincennes shootdown of the Iranian Airbus, the U.S. agreed to pay, I think, $250,000 per death uh, to the Iranian families. Remember the, with the Marine jet that severed a gondola in Italy? Same thing. That was done on a government-to-government -government basis. I don't know if any of you have read the Dames and Moore case from the Eisenhower administration. It holds that if national security uh, interests are paramount, the president is authorized to shut down any piece of civil litigation uh, under the guise of it uh, adversely affecting uh, national interest. 
and we were concerned that the United States government would take the position that uh, it is the U.S. government that should enforce the sanctions and obtain Libya compliance and negotiate compensation for the Lockerbie families. But given the political clout of the families, before deciding to do that, uh, we were invited to this, this, this meeting. Uh, there was so, I don't know, about 100 people in the room. And um, the chair said, why should we let your case go forward rather than the government handle compensation? And uh, my dad was very blunt, uh, uh, said to the various uh, uh, deputy attorney generals and State Department people there, well, it's simple, because you guys are going to screw it up. Uh, you're not going to know how to uh, get to a right settlement. The families don't trust you and won't trust you. We've been representing them for now, it was uh, uh, nine years. There's a level of trust. We can act quickly, decisively, and with the support of the families. And it was at that meeting that we were given a commitment by the government to, to let us go ahead. Now, uh, the other conditions were met. Nelson Mandela and one of the Saudi princes brokered the deal with Gaddafi, where Gaddafi turned over Megrahi and FEMA for trial. The, the sanctions required that they be turned over to the United States or Scotland for a trial under, under Scottish or U.S. law. Gaddafi offered to turn them over to a neutral third country, and that wasn't acceptable. And it was Nelson Mandela who ultimately brokered the deal that they be turned over to Scottish authorities, but the trial would be conducted at a former Air Force base in the Netherlands named Camp Zeist. That was Scottish territory. Scottish uh, police were there. They built a special court with bulletproof glass, and it satisfied everyone. Uh, we looked at it and said, it doesn't matter where the courthouse is, this is a trial under Scottish law by Scottish authorities. Libya has complied. The, the, the Libyan spin in the Arab press was we stood up to the United States and won. The trial is going forward in the Netherlands, not in Scotland. So it was a solution that satisfied both sides. Libya then, uh, Gary Hart was making trips to Libya, other people urging Libya to renounce terrorism, and ultimately, um, Gaddafi and the people uh, uh, in the inner circle recognized that Libyan self-interest required getting out from under UN sanctions and US commercial sanctions. We assisted the Scots in the Megrahi and FEMA prosecution by going over our evidence and testimony of witnesses, and taking a back seat until the criminal case was over. Once it was over, we, we could move ahead with our litigation. Uh, ultimately, in, in settling the case, um, we, uh, after, after many sessions, agreed on a number. And that number was $10 million per victim, regardless of economic loss, regardless of nationality. Under the uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, suit could be brought only by the family of U.S. victims or a U.S. plaintiff. And we took the position that it would be bad policy for Libya to pay less money to the Europeans, the Africans, uh, the South Americans. Libya wanted to use the, the, the settlement to, to get out from under sanctions. So we agreed upon a settlement where Libya would pay $2.7 billion into an escrow account maintained at an agreed-upon bank, the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland, and that $4 million per decedent would be paid when UN sanctions were lifted. The next $4 million per decedent would be paid when specified U.S. commercial sanctions were lifted. And the last $2 million would be paid when Libya is removed from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Um, ultimately, in the summer of 2003, uh, Gaddafi uh, renounced weapons of mass destruction. 
Uh, the Libyan ambassador read a statement at the United Nations where Libya accepted responsibility for Lockerbie, and Libya paid the $2.7 billion into the escrow account. And the first $4 million per decedent was paid to us in August of 2003 and distributed to the families. Uh, in September of 2004, President Bush lifted uh, U.S. commercial sanctions, and the second payment of $4 million uh, was made. The escrow account expired in February of 2005. Uh, it had been the U.S. position that Libya would not come off the list of state sponsors of terrorism until, among other things, uh, you know, Libya had to free the Bulgarian nurses under death sentence, pay us, pay LaBelle. But in uh, May, on May 15th of last year, President Bush sent his report to Congress certifying that Libya has not been involved in terrorism, and that triggered a 45-day period where 45 days later, Libya was removed from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Where we are now in the case is trying to work out the final payment. The Libyan position is since the escrow account ended in February of 2005, and the U.S. didn't take Libya off the list until May of 2006, Libya doesn't owe the final payment. Our position is the expiration of the escrow account which we needed when there could be no transfer of funds from Libya to the United States, does not affect Libya's obligation to pay whenever Libya comes off the list. We also have a good faith provision in our, our, in our settlement agreement, and we say that Libyan conduct, uh, such as the plot to assassinate Crown Prince, now King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, uh, the death sentence for Bulgarian nurses, things cited by the U.S. for keeping Libya on the list violates the good faith provision. So we, we hope and believe that this year we'll see the final resolution and uh, payment of the last $536 million for the Lockerbie families. Uh, and uh, uh, that could happen in the next month or two. Let me interject something, Jim. There's something very important for a student to take away. $8 million has been paid. If you're a plaintiff's attorney, you get a percentage. So you become a very wealthy man. So what to take away is you're better off being a plaintiff's attorney than a defendant's attorney. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most important lesson of the <clears throat> seminar. Bob, Bob, when did your hourly bill get paid? <laughs> Three years af after the services were rendered. So that's where we are in the Libya case. Um, let's see. Should we, any, we, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I, questions? I, if you all don't mind, I'd love to open this up to questions. Does anybody have? Well, I'd, I'd like to start with one. Has, uh, since your meeting with the, the government, uh, have they at all recognized your work as being diplomatic uh, in nature? And uh, have you? Uh, um, I, I can tell you this. Uh, the State Department hasn't been too happy for six years. We were told that the only party in the State Department was after our settlement. <laughs> uh, and, and you remember the last election. I mean, how many times did you hear, uh, it is our, fr from uh, this administration, it is our invasion of Iraq that frightened rogue nations and sponsors of terrorism, such as Libya, into changing their conduct. Uh, uh, when that statement was made in 2004, my, my, my wife was throwing a shoe at the TV <laughs> saying, you know, nothing to do with you. <laughs> but but um, I, I think one of the things that the law and the facts are great, and everybody needs them in their case, and indeed in this case why the legal hurdles were significant. And the fact that, that whether we disputed between the attorneys in the case, the, fact, the facts concerning Libya's involvement were, were clear enough to bring them to the table. But something you're going to find out in practice is that everything works better if it's in the right context. And this happened at the right time, with the right international conditions, 
for reasons that may not occur ever again, the United States government got behind a group of plaintiff's lawyers and clothed us with additional authority and the ability to act. And then things happened that were completely out of our control, such as uh, Jim's dad, Lee, who was the dean of aviation law in this country and was the oldest member of our negotiating team. The Libyans are essentially a traditional culture. And they, they looked at him and they respected him and they listened to him because he was the elder statesman of our group. And the rest of us worked hard and did a lot, but it wouldn't have worked without Lee. That was something that was not under our control. So as you go out into practice and you think about getting involved in things like this, planning's great. Understanding the law and fighting hard and going to court and knowing what you have to do is wonderful. But accomplishing something like this in your career comes as a matter of timing, context, and sometimes just sheer dumb luck. Yeah. I, on another very, very personal note, when we were negotiating with the Libyans, it had to be very confidential. And we told our clients, we're going to be involved in negotiations for months or years. And by and large, our clients had an extraordinary level of trust with us. Uh, I mean, after all, what client would tell their lawyer, go negotiate for me and don't, you don't even have to speak to me for two or three years. Now, the reason that happened is the Pan Am battle, the battle with the airline. This was an enormously expensive litigation. We did 189 depositions all around the world, and, and this was um, you know, a, a fight to the death. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say that probably none of our law firms could have survived losing the Pan Am 103 case. Uh, we invested our personal money in it. We devoted uh, two-thirds of the firm resources to the case for years in an extraordinarily difficult case. So having gone through that with our clients um, for seven, eight, nine years, when it came to Libya, uh, we had a level of trust that would not be duplicated by, by a regular client. And, uh, you know, the, the other thing, and it's kind of anachronistic to say, is if you want your clients to like and trust and believe you, don't sound like a lawyer. And that was the key to it with our clients. We broke every rule of negotiation in the Libyan negotiations. We bid against ourselves. We were candid. You know, we weren't, we weren't doing the, the, the usual cautious lawyerly routine. Uh, but there are, there are times when you'll face an extraordinary opportunity and an extraordinary challenge. And if you are seen by your clients or your adversaries as another suit, it won't happen. You've got to shed all that and be real and be present. But there's another point, too, and it was brought home to me in, in this case, something we forget. You are professionals. You've got to trust each other until you prove that you are untrustworthy. If confidences could not be kept, if trust was not there, I, I don't want to say we acted unethically because that would be a, a complete gross misrepresentation. But were we more forthright than with the secrets and confidences of a client? I think so. And it, it had to be to get anywhere. If you want to waste everybody's time and posture, look at the television shows. I, I just saw this one shark or scorpion or whatever his name is. <laughs> and I looked at this thing and I said, garbage. Forever, you couldn't do it. It's wonderful. Every, no one researches anything. That, that's, that's terrific. And everybody is basically dishonest. Well, here, yeah. no one was dishonest. When someone gave his word, and I have to use the he because it was just uh, other than one person, <laughs> it was all men doing the, the negotiation. They kept their word. And without that, because these negotiations went over a period of years, it would have been a mutual disaster and a very ugly litigation. I, I don't want to cut your questions off your hand, but going just on the back of what Bob had to say, if, if in something like this, which is so unique, you decide that you have to act like what you think your traditional concept of an attorney is, it's not going to work. The small things that made a difference here were saying to the Libyans after the first several months of litigation, why don't you have dinner with us? 
and we'll agree not to talk about the case. Tell us about your families. Tell us about your home. Tell us about what's important to you. And Jim's dad was a leader in that, and yeah, that was a right. breakthrough event. The other event was when you're negotiating with somebody who has every reason not to trust you. The lead negotiator, uh, Mohammed Abdul Jawad, for Libya's house had been bombed by Reagan, and his family had been threatened. And we went to him as a man, not as an attorney, who we have families, and we said, uh, we're sorry. That must have been very frightening. And after a while, they began to realize we weren't sharks. We weren't just American devils and lawyers. We were, we were people that were interested in keeping a civil process. And they responded to that very well. Yeah. The, uh, Jerry mentioned the dinner. I mean, it was, this, it was that meeting at the vice president's residence and the dinner that were probably the two most important events. And you have to remember, I mean, our clients, most of them would say, I don't want the money. You give me a, a chance you know, to kill one of the people who ordered the death of my child. That's what I want. I mean, if, if I die too, I would die a thousand deaths for that opportunity. I mean, th th this is a case of, of profound hatred and emotion. And it, was, it began very tense. But uh, after one of these meetings, it was my dad who said to the Libyans, come on over for dinner. We're going to get a big round table at the Hotel George Sank. And of course, the Libyans cannot drink alcohol in our presence. So it's a lot of fruit juice, wine for us, fruit juice for them. And later, uh, Mohammed steps out of the room and makes a call in Arabic. And they had an advantage about being able to speak Arabic. And you know, they spoke English. We didn't speak Arabic. And he makes a call, and only two years later were we told what that call was. Well, the call is Mohammed calling his childhood friend, Muammar Gaddafi, saying, Muammar, you'll never guess where I am. I'm at the George Sank in Paris having dinner with the plaintiff's lawyers for Pan Am 103. If we can have dinner with them, our country can change dramatically. We can restore relations with the United States. And it was that phone call from Mohammed to Gaddafi that uh, we're told later said, OK, go ahead. You can do the deal at, at 10 million. Well, there's one other point of importance, and it should be listed on the strange events. <laughs> Depositions were to be held. Now, the Libyans could not come to the United States. They couldn't get a visa. They were also barred from certain countries in, uh, in Europe. France said, oh, fine, no problem. You could have them here, except they never issued visas. So we're there. We had told the judge we're, we're going over for depositions, and they issued one, one visa to someone who had as much connection with this as any of you did, remembering you were five years old at the time this litigation started. <laughs> so Jim is deposing my client. And we have differing views on this. <laughs> Obviously, I missed something because I thought it was a total waste of time. Jim found very incriminating statements made. Um, in <laughs> any event, after the deposition, I'm having lunch with my clients. They are as happy as can be. Their whole attitude changed. Before it was, no, we're going to litigate this to the end. Well, maybe we should talk about it. What did it? I don't know. I, I, I've heard all these theories put forth. I don't know what, what the, the true one. But one, Your nice. client got to be on camera. He yeah. thought all of a sudden he was a TV star. What, you never happened? guess. He was I got so to happy. do a deposition. Yeah. He was so happy. And everyone's happy. And then we talk, then we get... We're talking real numbers then. And the real to this day, I don't think any the three of Mohammed and Lee Kreinler, who was really the father of all of us in this, walked out of the room, came to a figure, how they did, I don't know, and that was the figure that was kept. Well, I think we will end it there. Our guests are very willing to, to wait out in the in the loggia there if you have questions and if you want to to uh, speak with them, they'd be glad to hear it. But a big round of applause for our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.